Welcome everyone to the latest edition of State Scoop's webinar series sponsored today by Citrix. I'm your host, Jake Williams, State Scoop's Manager of Strategic Initiatives. Today's exciting. Today we take a look at cutting costs with software-driven networking and we'll explore how state and local agencies are turning to a software-first network architecture. that offers flexibility and agility to scale to meet regulatory compliance mandates. Joining us today are a few state IT thought leaders who've tackled some of these issues and have agreed to share some of the key lessons that they've learned along the way. I'm pleased to welcome Richard Rogers. He's the Deputy Director for Engineering for California's Department of Technology's Office of Technology Services. At OTS, Richard serves in the executive team and manages more than 200 highly technical staff within the state's data center. In addition, he oversees the statewide IT infrastructure and the implementation of IT policy governing existing and future IT systems. Uh, Richard came to the Department of Technology from the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you. And hello, everyone. So, um, this my talk would be of interest for anyone that have multiple locations and is planning on leveraging the public cloud um, for their infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. So, Absolutely. before I get started, I want to make sure that everyone under, have an understanding of what the um, Department of Technology offers. Yeah, hey, so, hey Richard, hold CDT on. Just gonna, I, just, I just want to introduce our other speakers, Richard. Hold on one second, all right? Okay. Uh, also joining sure. us today is Ken Liska. He's the Systems Engineering Manager for the State and Local Government Team at Citrix. Uh, Ken is based in Washington, D.C., and brings more than 15 years of engineering, consulting, and virtualization architecture experience to his role. He spends his days focusing on unifying apps and data into secure digital workspaces for state and local government entities across the country. Ken, we're thrilled to have you on the program today. Thank you. I also want to welcome our audience, including those joining us live today, as well as those tuning into the archived on-demand edition of this program. And again, I want to thank Citrix for sponsoring the program here today. Uh, before we begin, just want to help the audience get familiar with our console and how they can participate. At the bottom of your audience, audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. If you have any questions for our presenters during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of these as, there, as we can during the live webcast, either during the presentation presentations or toward the end of the program. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck will be available in the resource list widget. Looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon at the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area in your console. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. And finally, an on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast for up to 90 days. It can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So if you have any colleagues who might benefit from today's presentations, share your link with them. And uh, with that, we're going to get started. So Richard, your time is now here. You, you've been working on some innovative ways of developing a future-ready network and data center in California. Can you take us through that journey and tell us a little bit more about what you're up to there? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Again, let me just make sure everyone understands what the California Department of Technology provides. So we provide an innovative, reliable, and secure IT service to the state agencies, departments, boards, educational institutions, and local government entities in California. We connect over 3,000 customer facilities in all 58 California counties. We have two major data centers in California. We provide customer application hosting solutions for things like that you may be familiar with, like for people that need to do registration with DMV for their car registration or get unemployment disability insurance or for those employers that need to pay their employer taxes. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So we've been offering uh, IT services for these entities for over 40 years. And most of our services have been around managed services. What I mean by managed services is that we've been responsible for the platform as a service all the way down the stack, and we just rely on the customers to manage their application. And so a couple of things have uh, been asked for by our customer community. One, they want to be able to 
have more self-service. They want to be able to have more control of their infrastructure. The other is that there's a gap in some of the um, services that we provide, and they want access to the public cloud service offering. And so this roadmap, this IT st um, service strategy that we have here is going to be accomplishing those particular business needs that our customers are asking for today. So if you look on the, the right side, you see our CDD customers. They're coming down asking for um, services through our department. They connect to us through our California Government Enterprise Network. I'll talk about that network here in a, in a future slide. But you'll notice that you'll see a lock on that box, that network box. And that's the added security that they're going to be able to achieve by leveraging our services. And the customer has choices here. They could either use our managed services or they could choose to do self-service. If you look on the self-service side, we have the innovation lab, we have platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and software as a service. On the left side, you see our CDT managed services, which includes platform as a service, software as a service, and you also see C systems there. For those people that may not be familiar with Z systems, that's our mainframe services. Yes, we have a large number of customers that still depend on mainframe services, and that's one of our core competencies. You see what's included in our services for the CDT managed services on the left, and then on the right side there, um, we provide the initial onboarding and contract management. So those two boxes really articulate the services or what we offer today or what we will be offering in the future. You also look in the center there and you'll see that there's a cloud. The cloud represents where those services will be offered, either in our hosted data center floor, which says CDT hosted, or in the public cloud space, which is the CSP hosted. And you'll see a hybrid there. Now, when we talk about hybrid, we're talking about hybrid of two different types of options. Hybrid from a location perspective, we have several customers, large customers that have very complex applications, and they may have some of their solution that will reside in the public cloud space and some of it running in our public floor, on our, in our private floor, as well as they may want their part of their solution to be self-service, and they manage it, and we manage some of those services. Case in point for that is that we offer identity management as a managed service, and several of our customers depend on that to provide that managed services for them. But yet they may want to be able to manage their infrastructure, their web hosting, and, and that aspect. So this diagram kind of articulates where we're going to meet our customers' needs. On the left side of the table, it's kind of a timetable of where we're going in the near future. Um, the first part, within the next six months, we will be um, getting our first CSP for FabRap High due to the type of the protection data a lot of our customers require for high security controls and auditing capabilities. Maybe not everyone knows what FabRap High is, so let me make sure everyone knows. So FedRap stands for Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. It is a government-wide program that provides a standardized approach to security. We're also going to be aligning our services more with the CSPs with SLAs. Today, if someone has problems with their applications, um, we will do whatever we can to assist those customers. They may have a complex application that spans across the mainframe, um, Linux, Windows, um, database, DB2, or, or Oracle, um, and we will assign any number of resources available to help them triage and resolve their problems at no additional cost. In order for us to be able to align with our public cloud service offering, we're probably going to have to be more specific in what our roles and responsibilities are and maximize the number of hours that we provide for triaging so that customers are able to really understand the added value when they compare 
our service offering to the public cloud. A couple of other key things in the upcoming months, um, we will be extending our managed services up into the CSP space, and then 12 months from now is we have, as stated before, we have been offering managed services for over 40 years, and now we need to transition a lot of those managed services into self-service. So we need to do self-service automation to make those services available. So let's talk about our WAN network. So I've talked about before that we have a, a California government enterprise network. We call it CGEN. And that is a public-private partnership with multiple vendors to deliver secure network connectivity. It is a, a private network that only our customers are able to leverage. They use that to talk among each other if they need to share information and data. They use that to connect to our services at our data center floor. And then we have here, as you can see on the diagram, three legs that goes out to the Internet. They are at different locations and across the California, two in Northern California and one in Southern California. And we have IDS IPS protection for our customers to go out in and out of the Internet. So with this, this makes it simpler for our customers. They don't need to have that extra protection. Uh, we provide this Internet connectivity for over 250 customers. This is saving each of our customers for having to provide this level of Internet security. Okay, so that's one of the efficiencies and cost savings that they're able to achieve with this, this methodology. One of our goals is to enhance protection and detection on the state CGEN network. Another way to say that is that we need to find evil and boot it out. The endpoints will be governed by our security governance group. And in the future, we will obtain threat intelligence, email events, threat protection, third-party threat intelligence, just to name a few of the security enhancements that we're going to be providing here. With our next slide, we're going to talk about how we're going to be interfacing with those cloud providers that our customers want to be able to connect to. We describe this as our interconnect. This is a secure cloud connection. As you see here on the diagram, we have our customer WAN, which is our CGN network. We have our two data centers. They connect through. Um, we have infrastructure out on the floor to our, um, a, our um, Equinix data center who have presence with the cloud, multiple cloud providers. This is connected by two 10 gigabit network connections. Very high speed, um, ability to layer on custom security, higher performing, high speed and low latency, and lower access cost. Most CFPs charge to pull data down as well as telco charges. Our customers want to minimize those charges, so this is a way to do that. This also allows us to be able to add our IDS and IPS security tools. We will be expanding our network infrastructure into the cloud provider space. And so all connections to if someone, if one of our customers want to host an application, let's say on cloud provider one, let me talk you through what that connection would look like. Let's say that they're coming from their customer site on the customer WAN. They would connect through our data center, going through our internet interconnect connection, and get to the, product, the cloud provider one connection where their application is hosted. They would retrieve that data, and that data would transfer back through our data center back to the customer WAN. Now, since most of our uh, customers are for our California constituents. That is, means that most of our requests are going to be coming from our California constituents on the Internet. So let me back up to the Internet where most of our customer requests would be coming from. They would come through the Internet, through the IDS and IPS connections, 
through the sea gen cloud. Since this is within the sea gen cloud, it would come through our data center, through the WAN connection, through the, inter the, the Equinix data center to the cloud provider one where their application um, is hosted. They would then retrieve the data back. It would be pushed back through the WAN, back to the data center, and then going back to this previous slide, back out to the internet to the constituents that have made the original request. So as you can tell here, we're really focusing on security. We're also focusing on cost savings and efficiency. We need to protect our customers' assets. And with this design, we're able to achieve that. The next slide here is on our cost recovery model. I won't go through it, it's very simplistic. It's actually more complex than what it states here, but I will talk about a couple of the constraints and challenges that we have with this, or our cost recovery model. One is, we are a nonprofit organization, so we can't collect more than our services expenditures. Due to federal regulations, each of our services are mapped to a set of predefined buckets, and funds cannot be transferred between buckets to offset any losses. At the end of each fiscal year, if we've overcollected, we refund back any and all those extra funds back to our customers. So at the end of each, at the beginning of each fiscal year, is as if we have zero dollars again and we start all over. So some of the challenges with that is we have no way to get seed money for research or to start new services. So. The first set of customers must pay a huge share of that new service until more customers are come on board to leverage that service. Secondly, some customers may want to pay multiple years in advance. A lot of customers, they have some years where they are flush with money and other years they're lean. And at the end, they may want to be able to pay two or three years in advance. We have today no way to be able to obtain or collect that fund of money and spread that over multiple years. Third is when a customer asks for our resources, that may force us to have to buy additional infrastructure. We do not um, hold customers accountable for any length of time. It's like if you were to subscribe to a cell phone company, they make you sign for a two-year lease agreement, if you will, or, or an agreement. We don't, off, we don't have that kind of agreement with our customers today. So they're able to leave at any time. If we happen to buy infrastructure, we socialize our rates for that infrastructure over five years. So they may choose to only leverage and use our services for two years, and then they, they choose to move on and go someplace else. Well, we still got three years of infrastructure costs that we have to recoup. That's a challenge for us. And if we don't, if we're not able to maintain our customer base, then we're, we're at a negative and we're having to increase our rates to deal with that over that uh, under collection. So at a high level, I went over some of the efficiencies as well as our cost recovery model. With that, I'll hand it back over. That's outstanding, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's really exciting to see uh, where you and the team are headed in California, and I, I really look forward to hearing more about this in our Q&A at the end of the presentations and to just hear more about this as it continues to grow and develop over time. Uh, with that, Ken, I, I want to turn to you here. You know, I'm sure you're, te you're seeing a ton of interesting stuff across the state and local IT community. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and, uh, and how state and local governments are cutting costs with software-driven networking. Definitely, I'd be glad to. Thank you. So to start off with, um, I just wanted to go over a quick little biography for myself. Uh, graduated from the University of Rochester Institute of Technology in 2000. I worked for a Citrix VMware Microsoft partner company consultant for about seven years. Uh, I did my first stint at Citrix, uh, where I was a sales engineer for Department of Defense customers, specifically the U.S. Air Force and SOCOM. 
I then left for a little while, went to NetApp, where I was the virtualization solution architect handling uh, public sector VMware and Citrix um, customers. And I just recently came back to Citrix as the sales engineering manager for the uh, U.S. public sector state and local, local government region. What I did want to start off with is a, one of the one of my favorite quotes I've actually heard a customer say came from the Washington State Department of Transportation. I'm not going to read the whole quote to you, but in general, what it is, is he's stating that whenever things are performing poorly, and this is for the Department of Transportation, so these are people trying to go to the DMV's website or uh, voter registration or any sort of web, web registrations as a uh, constituent of the state, they're very quick to find out when there's problems. Um, plus all their internal systems and services, whenever there's a problem, the IT community finds out immediately. By using our technology, we were able to help them cut down. In fact, there was another statement he made that I cut off this quote, which was too, too big for the screen, was since they actually implemented our solution, they have had only one downtime incident for their network, and that was due to a configuration error, not an error of the actual product itself. So that's one of the stats he likes about it. It made his job easier and let them do more. So just uh, move on to a couple specific a couple specific examples of how the technology is being used in the world today. Um, now, as you may know, uh, so what you are probably state local government employees yourselves, not everyone wants to be a, a publicly referenced customer. So most of these are going to be descriptors of where the customer actually is, but not list their name. So the first one's going to be a northeastern state. Uh, it was the Department of Health Services. What their challenge was is they were using Microsoft Threat Management Gateway, which is a retired product, which is still under support. It's in its, it's, in its extended support lifecycle now. Um, they were looking for a way of migrating off that. Uh, Microsoft's recommendation is to actually move to Citrix to help them do that. What we were able to help them do is we were able to take 26, 26 different appliances that were running the Threat Management Gateway, reduce them down to a single, a single um, platform, we added two-factor authentication to the environment and gave them a test dev environment as well, while saving the cost and getting, migrating off that um, legacy software. Next is going to be uh, a mid-Atlantic state, central IT body for state agencies. Uh, what they were trying to do is they were trying to go to a multi-tenancy uh, environment. They had a collection of different organizations in the state were each buying their own IT gear. They were buying their own uh, networking. They were buying their own security, their own firewalls. They were all interconnecting. They were all these different portals into the government services. So what they were did, did is they, they consolidated five, for this specific agency, they consolidated five different devices down into three. While they were doing this, they also added in a web application firewall feature, which protects their applications from um, malicious attacks. I'll get more into that a little bit later in the presentation, but basically what that is is if web traffic is coming in, the firewall is going to allow anything to go to the web page. If someone's trying to do malicious code that inter interacts with the websites or tries to steal data or tries to do a denial of service, things like that, or, or, or manipulate like a SQL injection attack, that's where the web, web application firewall comes in. It's, it scans that traffic you allowed through the network um, and then tries and, and looks for that. They also went with this solution for the pay-as-you-grow aspect of it. And this is really big with customers considering cl cloud and consolidation. They like the fact of they're trying to reduce multiple disparate devices down. They're trying to rein in control. They're trying to save resources. Oftentimes, they don't know what every individual organization's requirements are. They don't know what the growth pattern is going to be. They're unsure, so they end up buying something that's way too big. What we allow, what we allow them to do, what we recommend is buy what you know you need today, um, and, we, and you can then grow into it. For example, our most popular platforms are uh, just software license restricted by how much bandwidth you want to put through them. So you put a device in today, and you can just grow it over time. Uh, next one's going to be a southeastern state. Uh, it's one of the top 40 most populous counties in the U.S. They had nine physical devices taking up uh, 18U in a rack environment. Uh, they were able to console it down to two Citrix devices with only four U. They had, a, they had a hardware renewal coming up in two years. We were able to save them over the cost of the three year, over the cost of three years uh, with the purchase of this. They were able to, including that what they would have been renewing anyways, they were able to save about five hundred half a million dollars, and they get, they saw the ROI within three years. So they were all going to have to make an expenditure in two. Uh, they saw the cost benefit savings uh, one year out from that. And the last one I can actually share the name of. This is actually the uh, where the quote came from as well, uh, the Washington State Department of Transportation. 
they took, undertook a severe consolidation of web servers. They were, we were able to offload tra the SSL traffic uh, authentication to our devices. Uh, they saw 40% savings in the bandwidth alone just to their services, and it greatly performed, uh, improved the performance of their web applications going through it. So they got better performance, uh, they got the bandwidth savings, and they had that uptime statistic I mentioned earlier about the only one downtime incident that was a known configuration error on their end. To start off with, what I'm going to talk about is when you're trying to go to a hybrid cloud or any sort of consolidated architecture, um, you're really going to need to start moving into a software-defined network aspect. Um, the networking is what you can it's your gateway to the system. It's where you want to ensure the high availability. You want to make sure that any devices you're consolidating or putting behind it, um, you can get to, even if there's a fa failure or fault tolerance, whether it be in the same building, um, different buildings, different states, different data centers, different clouds even. You want to make sure it's secure. Um, the security is going to involve authenticating your users to it, whether it be with smart cards, uh, federal government PIV cards, DOD CAT cards, uh, biometrics, or just any, any sort of smart card you want to use. And then if you're trying to deliver the services, you need to make sure that they're getting to the customers and they're getting to your customers or entities in a, in a fashion that is as good as they were receiving them or better, preferably even better than before. And as you're doing that, uh, if, it's, if many organizations, what they're trying to do is when you're trying to consolidate uh, the IT down to a centralized organization, is a chargeback model is a very popular is a very popular resource. That way, your IT central IT organization can, can invest the resources and you can charge back the individual clients for what they're using. That can have two effects. It helps offset the cost of, of actually acquiring the stuff, so you can pay for it through budgeting reasons. But it also helps wrap people from just ordering way too much. I'm sure maybe Richard may have more experience with this in the past, so he may have dealt with it. But oftentimes, if you ask an agency what they need, they're just going to tell you whatever the biggest thing is. Um, it isn't until you start letting them know there's a cost associated with that that they start scaling it back and figure out what they actually really do need. This is also where pay as you grow comes in handy, too, because now agencies, if they can pay as they grow, can, depending on how they have to do their contracting, can acquire a, what they, the smallest thing they think they need today maybe a little bit of extra growth room to it, but then they can pay pay and grow and, and without having to redo a whole purchase cycle or wait three years or five years out to get new hardware, they can just grow it through software licensing at more of an OPEX type cost. Um, you need to ensure it's highly available. Definitely if you're trying to go to different clouds, if you're trying to move everything to the cloud, if you're trying to move everything to a single cloud, if you're trying to keep some things on site in a local data center, maybe you've got security compliance requirements that certain data can't leave your network, uh, perhaps you want to use uh, leverage Amazon or Azure, or the, a GovCloud, or Rackspace. Um, you want to have the, abil the ability and flexibility to use all those different things and still uh, centrally manage your network gateway services. And lastly, uh, it's compliance. I'll, I'll, I'll dive more into security and compliance a little bit later on in the presentation. Another popular use case that we're seeing a lot recently is Office 365 migrations. Uh, one of the biggest factors that comes in, and comes, becomes an issue when an entity wants to go to Office 365 is the authentication services. So Active Directory Federated Services can allow you to maintain your, your credentials and your authentication at your site, and then you just pass a token off to the Microsoft, uh, the Office 365 cloud, to say, I've been, I've been authenticated. So this allows you to have your government employees maintain all the security credentials and securely just pass tokenized uh, a token yes no response back to officer 365 to give them access to it as this is a very popular use case we're seeing a lot of in the government space commercial as well but government is what i deal with so just to summarize some very popular the most popular use cases i'm seeing for why people are, are going to citrix for help with getting to the cloud or, or trying to improve their network their network usage usage is multi-tenancy uh, you've got multi-tiered, uh, you want to have multiple organizations uh, use the same hardware. And maybe you've got multi-tiered applications. Uh, a traditional use case would be you've got an entity that's got a web server. Uh, you've got one, you have one organization with a web server. You have another organization, maybe the Census Bureau has a database and they have a web server. You've got um, the appraisals office, maybe they have a web interface. The Department of Transportation, maybe the DMV has a web interface. All these entities have their own individual uh, interfa interfaces, which usually you have their own load balancing, they have their own app firewalling, they have their own uh, different, any, any features they have, they're, they're siloed in, so everyone, everyone maintains the individual licensing, the hardware, and the support of all those, all those things. We want to see companies trying to consolidate that in, 
maybe leverage some chargeback, but while they can solve it, they still want to maintain that individual, that individual access, and that's where our solution comes in. Uh, security and plot compliances. It's not as big in the state and local government space as it is in the federal government, but there is the Federal Information Processing Standard, FIPS. Uh, many entities need to meet FIPS requirements, um, so helping them meet that. Uh, maybe you've got HIPAA requirements or PCI requirements. Maybe you're doing uh, credit card transactions. You'd make sure that data is secure. Maybe you have the criminal investigation. It just comes up with the sheriff's office a lot where you need to interface with the FBI. You need to make sure there's certain levels of, of accreditation in the system there as well. Uh, migrating from legacy applications. So this was the state, the northeastern state I mentioned earlier. They were trying to go from Microsoft TMG. The other, mo the other very popular migration I see a lot of today and recently is Cisco Ace. Uh, in fact, Cisco actually recommends their customers move to the Citrix product to replace their Ace services, which is another product that is bad. It's still supported today. It's about to enter its extended support lifecycle, and they have introduced, they have announced the end of life date for the product also. Um, the other interesting one that, that, that I see, that we, that we see often, is to be able to run multiple different versions. So you're consolidating, so you're consolidating your appliances. Now maybe the DMV and the appraiser's office, their IT staff still want to support the product, but maybe they don't want to run their latest version, or maybe they need to run a certain version due to certain configurations they're doing, or that it's not comfortable with the upgrade cycle as maybe the sheriff's office or the fire department wants to do a faster upgrade cycle or whatnot. Um, our solution allows you to consolidate and may, while still maintain the, ver the ability to run different versions of the products in the same physical in the same physical box. And then, uh, then the last one is going to be um, just the, the effect of consolidating. We have customers who want to consolidate, like for example, um, where I mentioned the police department, the fire department, consolidating with the appraiser's office. Um, you may or may not have different requirements of how critical those systems are. Uh, usually, like E911 or fire rescue services are usually considered top tier critical. They've got very, very high requirements for uptime. Uh, but then you may have like the appraiser's office, which has office hours. Or if it goes down, it's it's not it's not a good situation, but it's not it's not life threatening. It's not an emergency service. So the ability to consolidate. Uh, to consolidate different levels of importance and requirements for uptime and limb balancing is another thing we see customers leveraging more into our product for, is to give them that flexibility as well. So when you jump into the um, application delivery controller, and so the device I'm talking about is an application delivery controller, which is going to sit at the, at the edge of your network and control the delivery of all the apps from your internal network to the outside of the network. There's a three different methods we, that you can undertake to actually start this consolidation. Uh, the most basic is going to be just pairing, uh, putting an HA pair of, of, of uh, controllers in. Uh, what happens if you do that? If you've only got an HA pair of controllers, you don't have any of that. It's not scalable. The more workload you put onto it, the, the tighter it's going to be. It's not very efficient because you tend to have to buy a buy, uh, tend to buy appliances that are much bigger than you need for an individual workload because you're not sure how the workflows are going to interact together with each other, uh, which also leads to CapEx, OpEx cost increases. Now you probably have to buy more devices you end up, and your consolidation network probably stalls out because you still have to guarantee certain devices, like maybe the police and fire have to have their own device because you have to guarantee that service, but you can consolidate a couple other agencies into another system. So that's the most basic level. Um, the next is we're going to see is going to be oops, uh, shared instances. This is where you run a virtualized version of the product. Um, uh, on like a hypervisor where you take like a VMware server or a Hyper-V server or a Zen server and you install virtual versions of an application delivery controller on there. Now you're able to get a lot of those, uh, that, that uh, dedicated um, CapEx OpEx, because you're, you're, you're sharing the same resources. You're able to see the scalability because you, you can scale that underlying hardware because you can put more memory, more CPU, you can get a bigger farm, you can virtually migrate it around a better hardware through vMotion or whatever mechanism your hypervisor happens to have. But you do lose that resource isolation, that lifecycle isolation. Now, you're, since you're running them out together, you've got to keep them, they have to be tied lockstep with the versions you're running. Um, you are going to be, even though it's virtualized, it's still going to be hitting the same physical hardware at the bottom, so you're no longer seeing that consolidation at that level there. Which is into the final step, which is what we typically recommend to the customers. It's a multi-instance hardware-based uh, consolidation approach. So for Citrix, what these solutions look like are it's a product we call NetScaler. There's four different ways we can actually we we have the NetScaler supplied. Uh, the first two are virtual. You can have a, what we call the NetScaler VPX. 
that is a single instance hyperbaser, hypervisor based. You can run a VPX NetScaler, and all these run the exact same version of code. Um, they, they, they manage the same way. They can be in the same environment together. That's the same software, just how it's delivered. So the VPX can exist in Amazon, can exist in Azure. You can buy it right from the marketplace or right from the uh, Amazon store. Um, you can install it on VMware, Hyper-V, or Zen server in your location. Um, you can use, we have a, we have a containerized version for, for, thing, for Docker. So if you're in, starting to use containers in, like in, a, in a DevOps type environment or you want to containerize things, um, we have our, our NetScaler CPX, which interacts in the container environment. I'm going to skip the SDX and go right to the, MD, the, M, the MDX. That's actually a typo. It's the MDX, not the MPX. Uh, what that one is, is it's a NetScaler device, which is a physical hardware. That's the, you have one, plot, you put the HA pair out together, and that, that's what it is. That's the most generic version of the product. That's just one piece of hardware, one product. Now, the flagship is going to be the SDX. The NetScaler SDX is a hardware-based system which runs our Zen server hypervisor as its, at its core, and then we run multiple VPX virtual instances on top of it. And we were, when we do this, we're able to actually isolate the security and share hardware. We can even put um, FIPS-compliant security cards in the hardware security modules inside this box and allow certain VPX instances to leverage the FIPS requirements and certain ones to not, so you can maximize your security controls there. So that gives you the best of both worlds of you have the physical guaranteed hardware, uh, but you also have all the individual little VMs, and you're not restricted at the normal hypervisor level where if you're just to run it straight up on, on Zen server natively without being on the, the, at the special SDX build, you're not going to get the same level of the hardware isolation. So the way we build these boxes, they're actually able to channel individual uh, the network adapters, the hardware adapters, the CPU access, and the hardware security modules, um, the host security modules. So this is kind of this is a picture of we want to try and virtualize what the SDX looks like. The actual SDX box itself looks like the the picture at the bottom there. All the little drives on top of it are just representations of the virtual the virtual net scalers inside it. Um, since you get the complete instancing per tenant, this can be a multi-tenant solution. So you could give a full a fully managed SDX instance to the fire department. On the same hardware, your appraiser's office or your department of transportation could also run their environments. What this is going to let them do is each one of those virtual net scalers can be running a different version. They can have different support life cycles. You could do maintenance on one one of the virtual SD one of the virtual application delivery controllers uh, while maintaining the actual connectivity and uptime on the other ones. Uh, a popular use case that we're seeing to customers use today too is test and development. So before an organization updates the, co the firmware code on their network appliance that controls the access to their network, they can actually run, they can actually turn on another virtual copy, upgrade the code on the virtual copy. Run, you're running on the exact same hardware device with the exact same network links and the exact same environment. You're just running an isolated copy of it and you can test, so you can test out and make sure the, the hardware chain or the software upgrade you want to do is going to actually work in your environment before you actually do it. When you confirm it's good, you just you just throw away that test box. You just spun up and do the actual upgrade on the real live on the real live system. This also lets you start. Uh, so the SD, the resources of the SDX can be rebalanced. Uh, if at one point in time you have um, an entity that needs very little resources and you give them an application delivery controller, say this is the fire department, and then there's a, or say it's a, a community college, and then there's a big expansion of the community college, and you need to give it more resources. Uh, it has more services, you can either just grow virtual, grow its virtual machine that it's using inside the environment to give it more access to more resources, change the quality of, ser the quality of service protocols in the background, or you can just cre you can create another, another virtual copy and still leverage that same hardware. Um, this is also going to work across, we call it, we call it tri-scale architecture. You can scale up, you can add more SDXs to the environment. Um, if you add more SDXs, you can actually you can actually divide your workflow virtually across multiple physical hardware boxes to get that extra growth there. You could do the pay-as-you-grow model, where you just keep that same SDX, or maybe it started off as the, as the lowest model, which I believe is 30 gig. Um, you put it by a software license upgrade, you upgrade to 60 gig, or you upgrade to 90 gig throughput. And you, without all, all that was is a license change. As long as the networking connectivity bandwidth exists that you're on there, you're good to go as far as that goes. Um, you can also do, uh, instead of having to put out a new actual application delivery controller or an individual NetScaler per every project, per every web service, per every organization, you can sell them, you can them all into that one box. Now, as one of the examples earlier where they had um, 
uh, they had five current systems that were just they were there in the environment. They consolidated down to three, uh, three systems at the end. The other interesting thing we see customers do with it, and it's more the Nesco is a very fully functional box. I'm only touching on the very basics of what you can do with it, but it's it's the unified gateway approach, and this will work for any of your services. Uh, it works particularly efficiently for if you're using other Citrix products like Zen App or Zen Desktop. Uh, but what we allow you to do is the Netscale can sit as a gateway. So maybe you've got services that require VPN access to your network, whether it be a VDI infrastructure or you have some web-based applications. Maybe you've got a SaaS app that you're using part of your environment. Uh, you've got client server apps in the back end. What you can do with the Netscaler is you can consolidate all those individual access points into one front door type gateway to your environment. So now they come in through the Netscaler and it allows them to access to all the different, all the different environments. One of our unique differentiators, especially good in a, like a, in, a, in a VDI or a virtual application environment, is we don't have a per connection license for that VPN access. We you just have we're just licensed to use the VPN the gateway features, and all users can use it. So that tends to be a major cost savings for customers, where competing products will charge you per actual user using the, their gateway or SSL VPN service into the network. To close up with the features I'm going to talk about today is another really cool feature of the Netscaler is it's part of an ecosystem. Because the, the because the our SDX appliance is running a virtual is, is effectively a Zen server environment, we can run other application loads. So all of these vendors here have actually certified their products to be able to be installed and run as a virtual workload on the Netscaler. So traditionally these would be devices you would actually set up in your environment. It would take hardware resources or virtualization resources from something else. Um, say, for example, you're going to put um, the, the RSA services, you're going to stand it up in a VMware environment. Mm -hmm. It's going to take up resources in your VMware servers. If you have the resources available on the Netscaler device, you can load it up right on the Netscaler. You can save that VMware, th those resources for different workloads you want to put in your VMware environment just by running it in the Netscaler device here. So it's another way you can consolidate any of these products. If they, as long as they fit in the footprint of the box or your SDX environment, if you've got multiple a cluster of them, um, as long as you have the resources available, you can then run these in that environment. Just to summarize of why the government, the, the biggest reasons why government customers, we see them moving to us, we're looking to our NetScaler for help in their consolidation efforts or their movement to the cloud. It's that true pay-as-you-grow model. You're not locked into, I bought this box today, now I need to buy another cop, more copies of this box. You can just do that. If it's, if it's bandwidth, if it's, if, it's, if it's resources on the box as far as like CPU and memory, then you would have to buy a new box, obviously. But if it's bandwidth, if you're just trying to get bandwidth usage out of your environment, uh, going from 30 to 60 to 90 gig throughput, that's just a software license you do. Uh, we're seeing on average about 2.5x more usage out of the resources when you do a consolidation with the Netscaler versus how you're using your other boxes in the environment. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole list here, just kind of looking through really quick. Oh, and typically whenever we do a price comparison with our competitors, especially when you consider the, the different devices you can collapse into a single, a single device here, you're looking at a, a much better cost performance ratio out of the solution. So just as my final closing, my final closing thought, I just wanted to put up what we like to call a little brag slide of these are all customers that are using the Netscaler product in production today as part of their day-to-day -day business. Um, let's see, there's no government customers on here. I covered those earlier, but these are pretty much every other vertical except the government. And hopefully you've, you've, I'm pretty, shocked, pretty happy you've heard of a couple of these companies. It's a place to reuse. So with that, I will hand it back over to Jake. That's outstanding, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, and the overview of what you guys are seeing at, at Citrix. Again, it, it's really exciting to hear how the state and local community is, is handling software-driven networking and really what, what are some of the great things that we're seeing uh, from that. So now that we've wrapped up both of our presentations today, uh, let's turn to some Q&A that we've received here from, uh, from the audience. First question here, how do, how do these software-driven networking and network modernization efforts, how do they fit into the greater information technology upgrades and modernization efforts happening in your state? So, so Richard, let's start with you, and then we'll get the broader perspective, perspective from, uh, from Ken. Yeah. Um, in order for us to do modernization or automation, the network has always been the slowest piece, um, especially when you're implying or implementing the security that's being required. And so doing that software-defined network um, allows us to have predefined building blocks, if you will, or templates, so that we could quickly deploy to wherever it's located at, either on our floor or in the public cloud. 
um, that this saves the time for provisioning so that we could turn these applications that's being asked to be delivered around a lot quicker. Um, it's been huge. It's been a, a heavy demand from our customers, and um, we're, we're, we are being pushed to have to go there. Interesting. That's a cool perspective. And what about you, Ken? I, I want to kind of pull it out to that broader perspective that you bring. Again, you mentioned, you know, kind of the geographic location of some of where some of your clients were. But but how how do you see this piece, this network piece, and the and the the software driven piece of that? Uh, how do you see that fitting into these greater IT strategies and IT modernization that we're ha seeing across states? Well, as Richard said, that that is the main reason. Uh, to take it a little broader, the one of the interesting use cases we see oftentimes is when a customer is trying to migrate. They're trying to dip their, their toes into the cloud. They're trying to use like their, maybe their first cloud service, whether the most popular two ICD government are Amazon's cloud or uh, Azure's cloud, where they're trying to go there. If they have to maintain these two totally separate networking instances, um, it becomes – it becomes a lot more difficult. The more you can virtualize your network, the easier it is to make those connectivities and those connections. Because the last thing you want is you don't want your 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 customers or your web your services. You want them to actually know that you're going to a cloud site or you're sitting at a data center. The the, the 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 more they feel like it's just they're going to your entity, the better it is. They don't care if maybe you're in an Azure data center in San Diego, um, and then you're over in an Amazon data center in Missouri. It's it's that whole making it as flawless. It's as it, it, as easy to visualize for the customer where they don't even know they're in a cloud, and as easy to manage on your end where you can just go to one control plane and manage all of your networking resources for your environment, without having to go to Amazon and manage that separate from your data center with Fantry, separate from Azure, for example. Just an example. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a good point. Um, if you notice in my strategic direction, there we focused that the the customers will only depend or focus on the services that they want. We hide where those services are located at from them, if you remember in that cloud perspective. They shouldn't care where their applications are actually running, as long as we're meeting their SLAs and their business requirements. Yep, there's nothing customers hate more than multiple logons or different windows. That's cool. Uh, so we have we have another question here, uh, kind of about the the collaboration aspect. You know, we're seeing at the data center level across state government, we're seeing a lot of collaboration with local government and some co-location of data centers and some co-location of um, of servers and, and services out of those data centers. How do you think, uh, and Ken, actually I want to go right to you with this one. How do you think that kind of the, the software-driven networking that we're talking about here, do you see it as an opportunity to enhance that collaboration with different levels of government, and how do you see that collaboration piece uh, playing in here? It, it, can, it can definitely enhance it. It's, having it there makes things easier. Um, whenever you're trying to do inter-organizational connections, there's all sorts of security things come up, um, maybe routing and access to different resources. The more that you can virtualize or leverage together, like um, was your question specific to maybe the counties and local localities within a state working with the state or states where the federal or states working with each other? Because those have different uh, ramifications as well. It can be a little bit of both, but, but let's, let's talk about specifically counties and cities. Yeah, so if, if they're able to share information, um, getting you the – the consolidation of the networking and, and virtualizing it will help make will help make you more agile as far as changing things in the future. Um, whenever you're if, whenever you have physical devices in the mix, you have to worry about where those physical devices are, how to physically maintain those devices, and the physical connectivity to them. As soon as you start virtualizing, the only thing that really matters is that the physical connectivity exists to wherever the virtual systems are. But it tends to be a lot easier to manage those virtual devices because they are virtual and they could exist anywhere. Um, the, other, the other thing you can do is when a device is virtual, maybe you have a contract with Amazon um, and you decide that Azure is more appealing to you, you can take a virtual device out of Amazon and put it into Azure just as, a, just, just as you're doing it. It's a lot harder to take a physical device out of Equinix and move it into somewhere else to, to deal with, just as an example. 
Yeah, and, and Richard, I, I want to turn to you with that same question. You know, I know that uh, elsewhere in Department of Technology, you guys are working on CalCloud, and that's a really good collaboration platform between the state and some local government agencies. So how are some of the efforts that you went over in your presentation, how are they enabling greater collaboration with, with local government in California? Uh, excellent question. I was just down in L.A. last week meeting with L.A. City and L.A. County. We presented them our roadmap, and they've been – looking at transferring some of their mainframe services over to us to take over so they can get out of that business. As we talked about our roadmap about especially the interconnect connection that we're going to be having to the public cloud providers, they were very interested in that because, one, they get the high performance that they're looking for. Two, they get the reduction in cost that, uh, that they weren't even aware of that they were going to be accumulating once they started accessing the cloud providers. And three, the most important, is the added security that they'll be able to have coming onto our network. So they're, they're eager to go and, and sign up to leverage that, that uh, those sets of services that I've talked about. That's really exciting. I, th I think we've got time for, for one more question here, and, and I want to ask the security question. You, you guys both alluded to security in your presentation and talked a little bit about it, uh, but I think it's, you know, in, in these, these trying times of cybersecurity awareness, I think it's important to, to emphasize it one step further. And, and Richard, you, I know you had a slide devoted to this, so I want to go right back to you. Tell me a little bit more about how these, these network modernization efforts and, and this, the future networks that you're trying to build in California, how are you emphasizing security on there, and, and how are you incorporating security into the discussion. Yeah, um, security has been a major focus because of some of the compromises that have happened over the last year or so. Um, it's got the attention of our legislators. And so we've got our, our new CIO, they gave them a, a direction to secure all of our assets. Uh, we can't afford to be compromised. And so we got way too many departments that is too expensive for each of them to try to take on the level of security protection if they were all to do it individually. That's why it's so important for our new design that, we, that I presented there to focus on funneling where the Internet connections is coming through. And then for State of California, it could really beef up our security our SOC um, perspective to protect all of California instead of each individual entity to do that. It's, it's just uh, we can't do it because of the size of our state. Um, you know, other states have been more successful because they don't have the size and magnitude, but with California and with us being such a big target for a lot of threats out there, um, it's, it's more important than ever before. So. If you notice, I really focused on security throughout my presentation, and, and that's the reason why. Yeah, absolutely. And we definitely noticed that focus, and, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how these issues continue to play out and how cybersecurity continues to be a part of that, that initial conversation about efforts like these. Ken, wanted to invite you to offer your perspectives here on, on security and, and kind of including security in software-driven networking. Yeah, so the security is, is pretty much the key reason why we actually have a, a whole vertical a, a team at Citrix dedicated to public sector. Um, state, local, federal, DOD, intelligence, civilian agencies all have very specific and strict security requirements that, though like banks have security and like uh, and hospitals and everything's have different security, the government in general is, is always under attack, under siege. So it has very specific security requirements that are all over the place. Um, and that's one of the big drivers we see people use our solutions. It's, it's for that security aspect. Um, in fact, like we just actually we're doing our, our annual Synergy con customer conference this week, and just two days ago we announced a new product around security for this. Uh, it's our Citrix Analytics Services, and what that allows you to do is since Citrix has all these different products that agencies may or may not be using. So if you're using the NetScaler as your access or your VPN support or you're doing uh, application delivery through it on your network edge, or if you've got users in a VDI session, 
or if you're doing the WAN acceleration, what we can actually do with the analytic services now is we can actually comb through our data we're getting in and make threat profiles on individual user bases where we're saying, well, it's looking like that user right there, the activities they just start, they've started undergoing in the past few minutes or few hours, that's a little suspicious. Maybe we would have to isolate this user out of the network. So we're taking security to that level now as far as not just the whole binary yes and no's. Um, other things we like to do, and this is an escalator feature as well, is we can, and this is bigger for the federal government, is where they want to ensure people are accessing the network through government furnished equipment or GFE equipment only. We can actually interrogate devices. Before we allow that connection into their VDI environment, we can say, hey, are you running – uh, are you running on a personal computer or is that a computer we gave you? We can check, are you running antivirus software and is it current? Are you running at least this minimum version of Windows? So you can check all those different features and depending on the responses we get back from the device, just in the back end for the client software, we can then give them different levels of access where maybe if they're on a, a, a government first equipment laptop or computer or whatnot, they can access the printer and they can actually print documents on they can save files locally. But if we recognize it as a mobile a mobile device or a personal computer that's not government owned, maybe we let them just view the data. They can't print it. They can't save it locally. So security is always top of mind with our customers, and it's a huge focus. But it's going to be it affects every aspect of our government usage, as far as I, I can see. That's really cool. That's a really good perspective, and and, and a great note to uh, to end on because I am afraid that we are going to have to end it there. Uh, so Richard, Ken, thank you so so much for sharing some of these essential lessons that you and your teams have learned over the t uh, over the course of time uh, with software driven networking. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank our audience once again for tuning today to State Scoop's webinar series. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Citrix for sponsoring today's program. Uh, just a reminder, our program today will be available on demand approximately one day after the webcast and remain available for up to 90 days. You can access it and download a PDF copy of the slides from the resource list on the console using the same audience link that was emailed to you earlier. Please invite your colleagues to tune in. It's free. All they need to do is fill in a brief registration card and view the entire program and also get the slides. Uh, look more for our coverage on software-driven networking and all our other state and local government coverage at statescoop.com. On behalf of all of us here at StateScoop, this is Jake Williams. Thanks again for being with us.